Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, as you can tell, or might be able to tell, we've had a little bit of some technical difficulties right from the start this morning, but uh, hopefully we have figured it out, and so we are very glad to have you with us. My name is Brady Beard, and I am the Reference and Instruction Librarian at Pitt's Theology Library, and today I'm joined by Janelle Moore, who is one of our graduate reference assistants. And Janelle and I are going to speak with you a little bit today about how to read a book, um, or in other words, how to do academic reading. Before we begin, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, you should see on the right side of your screen two tabs, one for a Q&A and one for handouts. Q&A is where you can ask questions uh, this afternoon during this webinar, and we will either do our best to answer them in real time by typing out the answer to you, or we'll reserve them for the end, and we will address your questions at the very end. Hopefully, we'll have a few minutes. And then the second handout or the second tab that you see will be the handouts tab. And that handout that is in the handouts tab is for the slides that we are going through today. And you'll notice that if you download that handout, that there are all sorts of hyperlinks in the handout for you. So you won't have to go sort of searching for some of the links and things that we'll talk about at the end or toward the end of our time together. So let's talk about reading um, a book in an academic setting or why we should even have this conversation about reading a book. Uh, presumably, we're, we're all in uh, graduate education or at a seminary, and we uh, know how to read at this point. Well, if you have even been in coursework for a few weeks now, you've probably realized that reading for seminary or reading for graduate work is a bit different from reading uh, that you might do on your own free time. In other words, reading, uh, say, the Old Testament textbook is not like reading your favorite novel. And uh, the basic premise of this presentation is that in seminary, you just have too much reading to do to get it all done, and that there is so much more out there that will be of interest to you, particularly when you begin researching for your projects or your theses or uh, whatever uh, research papers or things that you have going on in, in your work. And so we want to help you strategize uh, with uh, what it might mean to read in a graduate, graduate setting. So, the first thing that you should know is that when it comes to seminary and graduate education, you need to learn how to read a book without actually reading the book. The basic premise here is that you can get information about a book without ever having to really open it up. You can know what a book is about without having to actually sit down and read it cover to cover. And this is because uh, most books that you'll come across in your academic settings are arguments, and they proceed in the way that an argument typically proceeds. That is simply, a book will have a central argument or claim, then a lot of discussion about evidence supporting that claim. It may have some sections that are a sub-argument or maybe get into the nitty-gritty details of the nature of the evidence, and then it will conclude with a sort of big so what. And if you approach every book this way, what you'll come to realize is that most books are simply long-form essays with complex arguments and often more evidence than, say, an essay that's published in an academic journal. But the outline of books and articles is relatively the same. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is that some books are not intended to be read cover to cover, like you might read a novel or a collection of so short stories. Uh, this is obvious for certain books, like dictionaries. We, of course, don't read dictionaries cover to cover. Or even for things like biblical commentaries or commentaries on other sacred texts, uh, these are usually not designed to be written or to be read cover to cover. And you may only be interested in a certain part of a book or a certain part of the book's argument. And so what can you do then to 
strategize reading a book without actually reading it? Well, pretty simply, you can read about the book. You can assess the book's relevance and value very quickly. The way you can do this is by looking up the book or the item in the library catalog. Do a little bit of reading about the book in the catalog itself. Ask yourself, what is next to this item on the shelf? What else has the author published uh, on this topic or on other topics? Who might be reading this book? In other words, who is citing it? And then finally, you can read reviews of books to really get a handle on uh, what a book might be about. So I want to share with you just very quickly an example from the library record. So here you can see that I have gone into the library catalog, Discovery, and I have searched for this book, The Early History of God. Now, if I don't know anything about this book, The Early History of God by Mark Smith, I can begin to understand something about it just by paying attention to things like the subject headings. So here I have a pretty good sense that this book is about the Bible. It's about Israelite religion, and it is about the uh, Old Testament. I can also search the author here and see what else this, this author has written on this particular topic. So if the catalog will cooperate, I might have to refresh here. Here we have all of the items that Mark Smith has published on a wide variety of topics, and so I can get a sense of not only the book, but also this particular author. I might want to get a sense of who else is reading this book, and for that, one really good tool is to go to Google Scholar and to select the times that the item has been cited. So here you can see I've searched Google Scholar for the early history of God, and this book has been cited 802 times according to the uh, materials that Google Scholar is referencing, usually things like academic articles. I can click on this citation and it will open up all 802 results and then I can dip in and get a sense of how other people are reading this book. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I can read reviews about Mark Smith's early history of God. And to do that, I can log into the ATLA religion database right from the Pitt's home screen. I can search for the book title, limit the publication type to reviews, and with just a little bit of scrolling, I can get to book reviews of this particular item, and I can read those book reviews to get a sense of what the book is about and how it's been received in the scholarly conversation, all without even having to open the book, The Early History of God by Mark Smith at this point. We're gonna talk about some other places where you can find uh, book reviews, uh, but Atla, JSTOR are two great academic resources that you can access through the library catalog and library databases. And then two that are freely available online are Reading Religion and the Marginalia LA Review of Books. So we've strategized a little bit about reading about the book, but let's say you need to go a step farther. So strategy two is to read the book by looking at the book. The first thing you're going to want to pay attention to is the book's layout. How is it organized? You can use the title and the table of contents to help you assess what the book is, what the subject is, and how the material is organized. Read the introductions and conclusions, both to the book as a whole, and then to each individual chapter. And then after you have a sense of what the table of contents are about and what the book itself is about, you can dip into those chapters that are of interest to you and you can read those. This is usually what academics mean when they say they read a book. It means, uh, very rarely does it mean that they've read the book cover to cover. 
most of the time, it means that they have done a close read about the book. They've read book reviews and they've taken a look at the actual contents of the book and read the sections that are of interest to them. So here's an example of what it means to read a title. The primary title of this book is A Cosmopolitan Ideal. That title doesn't tell us much, but if we zoom into the subtitle, Paul's declaration, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor male and female, in the context of the first, cent of first century thought, we can begin to get a sense of what this book is going to be about. We can then turn and take a closer look at the table of contents. Here's the table of contents from another book, and you'll see that it looks a lot like an outline that you might use to make an argue, uh, to write an argumentative essay or a research essay of your own. Insofar as an outline can be a really good indication of what's important to the particular author, so too a table of contents will give you a lot of information about the book. Then you might want to consider reading the layout of the book, paying special attention to the introductions and conclusions of each chapter, and any major section headings that draw your attention, or entire sections that look like they will be relevant to the study that you're in, whether that's in a classroom and doing an assigned reading, or doing research for your own uh, work. So Janelle is going to talk with you a little bit about reading a book by actually reading it. So I'll turn it over to Janelle, and then we'll return to some of our big picture strategies in just a few minutes. Great. Thank you, Brady. So let's say you've gone through the process that Brady just outlined and realized that this is the book for you, and it is indeed worth your time to sit down and read it. The next thing that you want to do is to identify both a reading strategy and a memory strategy. Because I don't know about you, but I have definitely had moments where I've sat down to read a book and have spent hours or even days reading it only to get to the end and realize that I didn't really take away what I needed from that book. And so we just have a, a couple simple strategies to make sure that you're using that reading time well and are engaging with the text actively. And so when we say reading strategy, you know, a key to keep in mind when you sit down and start a book is to just keep remembering why are you reading this book? What are you looking for? Is there a specific thing that you need to learn? Is this for a particular paper you're working on? And just constantly have that in mind so that at the end of each chapter, you can ask yourself, okay, what have I learned from this? What have I gained? How is this helpful to me with my learning goals? Um, and so one, one active reading strategy is to really develop your own symbol system. Um, you know, I know that a lot of times in, in undergraduate uh, programs, they talk a lot about using highlighters and pens and uh, sometimes, though, when you do that, you end up with the whole page highlighted. And once you get started underlining, it's hard to stop. So one, one idea is to come up with your own symbol system. And, you know, that could be drawing exclamation points on the side of the page or question marks. Or I use different tick marks. And the, depending on how many tick marks I put, that, that tells me, okay, this is worth copying over. That was just interesting. So that, that's one reading strategy. And then also just generally, it's helpful to have a memory strategy going into it. And just a rule of thumb there is that the, the more you reflect on something, the more likely you are to recall it. Um, so we have one very simple practice is just at the end of every chapter, use that as an opportunity to ask yourself, what was the key point from this chapter? What's my big takeaway? How does this connect to my own learning interests? And um, we'll, we'll share this later, but there are a lot of more formal mem memory strategies that, that can be worth taking a look at um, with different online resources. So now just two more specific reading strategies. The first one is from Kate Turabian. You'll recognize that name from Turabian Style. And she recommends a, a reading strategy of creative agreement and creative disagreement. And this is a way just to be sure, once again, that you are engaging with the text actively and are not just passively flipping through the pages without absorbing or integrating what you're reading. 
And so, you know, she, she says that creative agreement is important and that this invites you as you're reading to ask, you know, what, what else uh, could have the author done to have strengthened this argument? What other support could have been offered? But then creative disagreement, she argues, is actually even more important to be constantly asking, you know, how, how could the author have convinced me if there's a point that you don't agree on? And is it a question of evidence? Is it the author's claim itself? Is it the sources that aren't convincing? What, what more is needed or what voices are missing here in the text? And then also, what's at stake if I agree or disagree with the author's claims? And then the second and final reading strategy that we want to highlight before we move into just some more general tips is actually from Candler's own Dr. Deanna Womack, and it is a 5A approach. And so these are just five points that all happen to start with A, which is helpful for remembering them. But these are just five things that she recommends that you kind of constantly keep in the back of your head as you're reading and then track these different things as you go along so that at the end of the book, you can confidently say what each of these points are. And so thinking about the author's aim, which is really kind of the big picture, the lesson that the author hopes the reader will embrace by the end of the book, the argument, which is connected to the aim, but is more about the specific points, the specific claims, um, and that then feed into the aim and that overarching purpose of the book, the approach. Um, so thinking about how is it that the author makes makes the argument? What types of sources are they using? Are they using historical texts? Are they looking at scripture? Are they doing ethnography? Um, you know, how are they crafting that argument? And then number four, thinking about audience, which is sometimes, you know, expressly spelled out at the beginning, but sometimes it's something that you have to glean by paying attention to the language that the author uses and things like that. And then finally, and this one can be particularly important when you're analyzing what you've read, thinking about the author's assumptions. And again, some authors will be really upfront with you about their limitations, but sometimes this requires doing a little bit of research. And as Brady mentioned earlier, doing some Googling to see what else has this author written, where, where are they doing their research from? Sometimes the acknowledgments can actually help give you a sense of, you know, who they're in conversation with and how their social location might be informing what they are writing. All right, so now back to Brady, just for a few general tips for reading well. All right. Thank you, Janelle. So some general tips for reading well are to find, uh, the first major tip is to find the resources out there that are available to support you uh, and to help, this can help you decide what you should be reading. Um, so speaking with your professors or others, subject area experts who might be able to sort of lead you in a particular direction can be really helpful. Uh, but then also just taking time to explore the ways of reading that work for you. We all read very differently. Janelle uh, already mentioned one of her favorite reading practices, which is to sort of devise a notation system that makes sense for you and works for you, that can help you to remember what's uh, most interesting. I also use a series of check marks and exclamation points or question marks as I'm reading uh, something in depth. And then at the end of each chapter, I, if it's a book that I own, I like to utilize the space, uh, you know, either at the beginning of a chapter or at the end of a chapter, depending on how the item has been published. But I like to just scrawl a couple of quick notes in there about what that chapter was about and what was important for me to remember. Uh, but of course, exploring ways of reading for you could mean things also like finding a space that works well for you. Do you need it absolutely quiet? Do you need a little bit of background noise? Do you need chaos to sort of be able to focus? Everybody needs something different. So there's no one size fits all, but we do have some great general tips. So uh, our first tip is to ask a librarian. Uh, during the fall 2020 semester, Pitts librarians are on chat five days a week from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. to 
talk with you in real time, and we are more than happy to help you figure out what you should be reading or to map a research project or to even give you pointers on how to read something. Uh, we are also available by email um, all day, every day, and uh, you can both chat with us or email us by clicking on the link here in the handout to Ask a Librarian. This will take you to pits.emory.edu slash ask. And um, we will even um, be able to, we can even meet with you over Zoom if you need a longer conversation than one that can just take place in the chat. Usually what we're going to do though is uh, depending on sort of what type of support you're looking for, we may point you in the direction of the Pitts reading uh, research guides and the Emory databases. Pitts research guides cover 70 or so topics related to Christian theology and the study of religion that uh, as it's taught at Candler School of Theology. And so these can be really great places to begin if you're wondering uh, where you should start reading for a particular topic. We always encourage you to use our research guides. These guides are written and designed by Candler faculty, librarians, and graduate students with specialized interests, and they can be a really great resource for you. Emory Databases uh, is where you can go to find book reviews or even annotated bibliographies. If you've never gone to the Emory Databases and looked uh, for Oxford bibliographies, I would encourage you to do so. The Oxford bibliographies cover a wide variety of topics related to religion and outside of the study of religion. And each uh, one of these bibliographies contains a sort of subject a dictionary that you can get in even further and start asking specific questions about the type of uh, research that's available. And then each one of those entries is chock full of annotated bibliographies written by experts in that field to help you understand that area better and to begin uh, sort of understanding what is out there. It's sort of, they're sort of like tiny book reviews. And so they're really, really useful. Uh, Janelle, I think, is going to talk with you about some other online reading aids, and then we'll have some time for questions. Yes. So as Brady mentioned, um, we've got a copy of these slides and the PDF handout. And so I would recommend downloading that because all of these here on this slide are hyperlinked. So you can just go directly to them and bookmark them if you want. Um, but in addition to the wonderful Emory resources that Brady just showed us, there, there are lots of other reading guides as well that other universities like Harvard have created. Um, Harvard's guide, The Six Reading Habits, is really helpful. They've got some fun um, infographics and just some very concrete steps, including ideas about how to come up with your own notation or symbol system, and then some, some memory and recall strategies as well. And then um, you'll also find there are some reading resources that are, are more specific. So next we've got one that's specifically about reading uh, for history that was produced by Bowdoin University. And then um, there's also writing theology well. So that's you know specifically about theology. But there are a couple of pages in that book that are also about reading theology well, which might be of interest to you. And then Harold Bloom's classic book, How to Read and Why, um, that is just a, a good overview, again, of how to use your time well when you are reading and to just actively be reading. And then um, actually some of the style guides, specifically Chicago Manual of Style, has a great little section on um, not just writing, but also reading and reading for clarity and for understanding. And then Brady mentioned these two earlier in the beginning when we were thinking about reading about books to then determine how to use the book well. And so Reading Religion and Marginalia, LA Review of Books. Both of these are constantly being updated with great academic reviews um, of the latest books, uh, specifically of religion. In the case of Reading Religion, it's connected to the AAR. Um, and then more broadly, all sorts of different books in the Marginalia page. And then finally, we also wanted to encourage you, even during these times, and perhaps especially during these times, to read together. 
and to read to read socially you know right now that might look like having a zoom discussion once you finished a book or talking about it you know over a phone call but this again goes back to recall and goes back to wanting to make sure that what you're reading is really contributing to your learning and contributing even to your formation as a scholar and um, in, in your vocation. And just the more that you discuss what you read and what you learned from what you read, what you liked, what you didn't like, what was helpful, the more that it'll stick with you and actually be something that you can carry on after your days here at Emory. And so I think that is that is all of our overall tips. Um, so we do now have plenty of time for questions if anyone wants to put something in the Q&A. And then otherwise, just a reminder that your Pitts librarian team is always available, as Brady mentioned, and can be reached uh, via pitts.emory.edu slash ask. Um, and, you know, over email, over chat, or to set up a, a longer conversation or a Zoom research consultation. Thanks, Janelle. And I'll just say one last thing, uh, and perhaps this is one of the most important takeaways. Remember that books, especially those that you are reading for classes or your research, are essentially arguments. They have a particular aim and a particular methodology to try to convince you of that argument. And so anytime you read, it's always helpful to remember that you're entering into a conversation with the author and with uh, others who the author has cited, or maybe your classmates or your instructor. And if you treat uh, reading like a conversation and you rely on all the tools like book reviews and uh, the table of contents and the actual content of a book, you can get a really good sense of where the conversation is at and where it's heading. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, I think we will go ahead and wrap up today. We are so grateful that you joined us. And as always, you can reach us by visiting pitts.emory.edu slash ask and someone from the library reference team will be more than happy to help you on your reading journey. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.